Hey, you see that length? That's because there's a lot of work going on in this. So let me start with, please rate, comment, subscribe, follow my socials in the description, and follow me on Twitch. I stream a bunch of stuff. Let's have fun, but on to the main event. Welcome to my guide on every single Masked Carnival fight as of Endwalker. In case you don't know where or what it is, the Masked Carnival is a feature of Blue Mage unlocked through their job quests. It's right outside the Miners Guild and is a set of many different fights of varying difficulty. Some are puzzle more than fight, and I'll be going over each one, one at a time. Be sure to use the timestamps and chapter select to get around to any specific fight you want to go over. Keep in mind that this is an ever-expanding MMO. If stat squishes change damage values from what you see in the video, these strategies should still all apply with little variance. If you are seeing different values and aren't in a different stat squish due to further expansions, you're probably not following all the advice. This guide is a two-part guide. The first half will be doing every fight with minimal spells, basically following intended strategies based on their release. This will also go over every mechanic of the fight, the solutions, and all that. The second half of the video will be the nuke everything half, and by half I mean fraction of the runtime since a lot of the lengthy fights will now end in 10 seconds. The nuke side of things will be your ideal way of handling things to minimize difficulty. This is going to require you to collect every spell in the log just about, or at least all the ones I have in my base toolkit and a few specific others. Some of these fights can be rather hard to complete otherwise, and in a few specific situations, you have to deal with them fully anyway. Further, these are not all optimal speed kills. This is just me using what I believe is basically the optimal dot opener, which isn't even the correct call in a lot of situations due to how quickly enemies die in the nuke portion. Finally, do not attempt the carnival without having level cap gear, be it level 50 ironworks for the first 25, or all the way up to current level cap. I am in full I-530 gear through all of this. This is as best as I can get without going full best in slot. By the point you start Blue Mage, you have the option of getting Poetics and the gear from it, so you have no excuse. If your HP or damage doesn't match mine, you forgot something. I will also be bringing up any achievements tied to the carnival along the way, including the hidden achievements and giving you advice on how to reach those. As said, my toolkit for the fights will mostly follow what our toolkit was at release. Feel free to suggest your own solutions between the minimum and maximum. I will be mostly showing the full fights in the minimal spell attempts to allow you to see how it all goes. Finally, anytime a fight requires a magical attack, I will be showing spell number one, Water Cannon, as the example toolkit. In the footage, I will be using spell number 53, Electrogenesis. Anytime you need a physical attack, I will be showing spell number 5, Drill Cannons. 1. All's well that starts well. Requirements? Any attack. 3. Very basic enemies. The slimes put poison on you, and the knight uses basic frontal AoEs. Pull only one at a time for absolute safety, but you should be able to handle all three at once. Just avoid the AoEs the knight uses. 2. Much ado about pudding. Requirements? Two magic spells of any two elements, or an unaspected magic spell. Recommended, a magic spell of every element. You can use the sort function of the Blue Mage spellbook to sort by element. If you go for an unaspected attack, make sure it isn't a physical attack. Some of these are immune to physical. Pull one slime at a time, as they hit pretty hard and have a good amount of health. This entire duty is to teach you the importance of elemental weaknesses, which you might not have one of each without getting deep into spell collecting. The element above the enemy's head is their weakness. One magic spell will be able to take out all but one element, the matching elemental slime. So the earth weak slime is lightning based. That means a lightning based attack will never work, and we need a different element. Otherwise, very little to this. 3. Waiting for Golem. Requirements? Number one, water cannon. This guy is weak to water, so a water attack is better. Your main issue is frontal AoEs. Stay close to the golem to easily step behind it. After losing enough HP, the golem will gain two new attacks. It will cast Earth and Heart, a circular AoE aimed on your position, almost always twice in a row. These place fire puddles on the ground, so don't walk into them. The other attack is Obliterate. It only does 1,000 damage roughly, but is unavoidable. As long as you keep attacking and don't get hit by avoidable stuff, you're fine. 4. 
Gentlemen prefer swords. Requirements? Any magical attack. Recommended? Number 10, Glower. Number 13, White Wind. Number 24, Flying Sardine. This is a two-act fight with high damage enemies. Act 1 has three enemies. You cannot pull them one at a time, so you need to either kill them first or have some sort of healing. Take down the bats first as they have less HP, especially if you exploit their weakness. Get lucky on the critical hits and you might not even need a heal, but bring White Wind anyway. In Act 2, we have a singular night weak to lightning. The main worry here is that it does a very thin line AoE called Grand Strike pretty often and multiple times in a row. After getting it low on health, it will begin to cast Magitek Field and spawn six Earth Weak Beetles. Silence the Magitek Field with Flying Sardine and then burn the knight down. If he dies, the fight is over, even if the beetles are still alive. By the time the beetles do any damage, the knight will die. And you have White Wind anyway. 5. The Three Penny Turtles. Requirements? Number 36, 1000 Needles. The only way to damage these turtles is to use death-based spells or 1000 Needles. 1000 Needles is the easiest to obtain and likely all you have. The turtles can't even hurt you, which is why the arena is electrified on the outside. You will need 6 casts total to finish off the turtles. 6. Eye Society. Requirements? Any magical attack. This is a gimmick puzzle that you can entirely ignore. The Mandragora give you a blind from their AoE, which negates all gaze mechanics, the eye icon, from the Katoblapos and the eyes in the second act. You can just solve the gaze mechanic the normal way by turning a character away from the enemies using them. 7. A Chorus Slime. Requirements? Any magic attack. Number 31. Sticky Tongue. Recommended. Number 25. Snort. Our first three-act carnival fight is a gimmick fight. Slimes have very low health and will die in basically any singular attack. First act? Just kill the slime to kill the ice sprites. Don't get too close though, as the slimes exploding will kill you too. In the second act, we have ice sprites hiding behind blocks and a bunch of slimes in the middle of the arena. You must move the slimes to the ice sprites to take them out together. This is why we bring Sticky Tongue, to move the slimes around without killing them. Properly placed, you should only need two Sticky Tongue uses to get the slimes around the blocks. Kill the slimes once you get them in position. In our third act, we have six slimes and two giant towers. We need all three slimes on each side to kill a node, so Sticky Tongue spam to get all three slimes around the wall. However, the towers will start casting very long attacks that do a lot of damage. Hide behind the walls to avoid these attacks. Kill one slime once you have them all grouped up at the tower, killing them all at once. Get behind the wall again after you do though, as the towers will do a revenge attack when they die. Because of the delay of slime death into slime explosion, you do have a moment to hide, but you must be quick still. This is also why you may want Snort. It shortens the effort of this act by a tiny bit, but you'll still want to use Sticky Tongue to ensure the nodes get hit. 8. Bombity of Errors. Requirements? Any magic attack. Number 24, Flying Sardine. This one is just like the slimes, but with bombs. Kill the front bomb, they all die. The second act has an actual fight involved. Kill the small bombs to chain reaction and freeze the main enemy. Often it will glitch or something and set off all the bombs at once, rather than letting you do the chain reaction three times. Even if you use all three, you'll have to fight the main bomb for a while. It has two major attacks. The first is Sap, a slow cast but large AoE you must avoid. The other is Burst. You cannot hide behind the walls for this one and must interrupt it. Use Flying Sardine every time Burst comes up. The other option could be to freeze it with the Chain Reaction Bombs, but as I said, it doesn't seem to completely work right. Why? I don't know. 9. To Kill a Mocking Slime Requirements? Any Magic Attack Number 13, White Wind Number 24, Flying Sardine This is the first fight that ends up pretty involved. The main boss will spam Death Ray for damage and the spell Dark. Dark is a small AoE aimed at you. Dodge out of it and it will leave behind a dark puddle you cannot step in. After a bit, it will cast Golden Tongue, a magic buff that you would do well to interrupt with Flying Sardine. 
at the same time, a second slime will spawn. Be sure to white wind when you reach half health and interrupt golden tongue every time the boss uses it. You can otherwise completely ignore the other enemies. Just keep hitting the boss and stopping its golden tongue casts. 10. A Little Night Music Requirements? Any magic attack. Number 13, White Wind. Number 24, Flying Sardine. This is the first fight with a hidden achievement. The boss is pretty simple. It will use Cloud Cover and Iron Justice as simple AoEs you must avoid. After a bit, it will use the interruptible King's Will to give itself a stacking buff. Let him use the buff unless you want the easy mode version of this fight and lose out on the achievement. If you stay on the offensive, it may only happen twice before you reach 40% HP. If you get him below 40%, he will stop using King's Will. We want him to use it three times, so after hitting 45% or so, stop attacking. When the third King's Will begins to cast, start going once more. This is where the real fight begins. The buff makes him take very little damage and do a lot more. He will also gain Black Nebula, an unavoidable AoE that you can interrupt. This is why we bring Flying Sardine, as it kills you instantly. Cloud Cover has also changed. Rather than being a targeted, avoidable AoE, it's an unavoidable attack you need to recover from. Be sure to use Lucid Dreaming as often as you can to keep your MP up between heals. After enough picking away at his health, he will fall and you will gain the achievement the harder they fall. 11. Some like it excruciatingly hot. Requirements? Any magic attack that hits the enemy directly. This is another sort of gimmick fight. These bombs will get knocked back super far from taking any sort of damage. If you leave them alone for too long, they cast an explosion, killing you instantly. The first act is simple. Knock one bomb toward the other and then just spam attacks to kill them off. The second act is more dangerous. You can't quite group all the bombs like the first fight with attacking, so we just don't bother. As long as the attack hits the enemy directly, you can hit every bomb from the center of the arena. Make sure to swap to the next target in line to keep the cast bar at bay, and you win. 12. The Plantum of the Opera Requirements? Any magic attack. Number 13, White Wind. Recommended. Number 1, Water Cannon. Number 16, Ice Spikes. Number 23, Phase. Ice Spikes is completely optional, but very much the ideal solution and far easier. Use Ice Spikes, then hit any of the plants. All of them will attack and take damage from the Ice Spikes, dying instantly. The second act has a water weak singular boss. It has a frontal AoE of Wild Horn. Just dodge out of the way. Soon, it will cast Inflammable Fumes, which has a very long cast. This is a good opportunity for free damage. Before the cast ends, use Phase to stun the boss. This will cancel the cast, which will otherwise do about half your health and damage. Simply White Wind if you take the damage. It will then cast Spore Sack and summon a few plants from Act 1. Ice Spikes as the cast completes and go back to hitting the boss. After Spore Sack, Trounce will be spammed at you. Stay close to the boss to avoid these. From here, the process will repeat over and over. The next Spore Sack usage will be used twice in a row. Using Ice Spikes as the first cast goes off should be enough for both sets of plants to get killed. Just take the boss out now. Phase any further inflammable fumes if you brought it and dodge the AoE sent you away. 13. Beauty and a Beast. Requirements. Any magic attack. Recommended. Number 24. Flying Sardine. The first act is very simple. Kill the main enemy, then kill the two enemies that are petrified. You could theoretically use a skill to exploit their petrification, but it's hardly needed. Act 2 is a bit more involved. This is a repeat of the Hawk Manor hard boss. She will cast Void Fire 3 as a small AoE where you are. Void Arrow is the line towards you. Dark Sabbath is a gaze attack that you only need to look away for. Dark Mist is a large AoE around her. And Circle of Blood is a large donut around her. Try to keep her at the edge of the arena and get close to her for Circle of Blood. Her next attack will be Void Fire 4, a very large AoE aimed at you, which will then cause further AoEs that chase you. Bait the AoEs around toward the middle of the arena and then dodge the follow up AoE. The boss will then summon an add. It will start casting Beguiling Mist, which can send you into the electricity if it goes off. 
If you brought Flying Sardine, you can just interrupt the cast. Otherwise, make sure you're in the middle of the arena when it goes off, and you won't even be sent into the electricity. Now, you're supposed to kill this ad, but you can just... not. Keep hitting the boss and she'll die before the ad is a problem. 14. Blobs in the Woods. Requirements? Any magic attack. Number 7. Loom. This is a weird one. The first act is just two slimes behind walls. Kill them and they will revenge cast the last song. Hide behind the walls to dodge these explosions. In the second act, the slimes will start attacking, slowing you to the point of being unable to move. This is where Loom comes in. Kill off the slimes one by one, and then loom your way to safety behind the giant block wall. Repeat until they're all dead. Sprint also works to negate the slow, but won't really be the best solution, even if you can make it work. 15. The Mean Nobody Nodes. Requirements. Any magic attack. Number 18, Acorn Bomb. Number 24, Flying Sardine. This is a fairly beefy enemy. Attack it a bunch, and it will open with high voltage, an interruptible attack to use Flying Sardine on. Soon after, it will explode with a summon, doing minor damage and spawning a single Shabti that will murder you due to a very powerful buff. Acorn bomb it to put it to sleep, and keep hitting the node. The node can do a number of different attacks. Piercing Laser is a thick line towards you. Superstorm, which is a donut with no AoE indicator, so move closer. Repelling Cannons, which is a large AoE around itself, where only the edges are safe. It only seems to use this one when you are at very point-blank range. And Ballast, which will do progressing AoEs towards you. Be behind the boss as the cast ends, or dodge as the indicators disappear. A second high voltage will go out when you can begin to take out the Shabti. Its buff should be wearing off now. More AoEs will come out of the node, and the Shabti does frontal AoEs of Spell Sword very rarely. Interrupt any other high voltages and keep beating the enemies down. Keep watch on what is casting next so you can dodge safely. Soon the node will use summon again, this time spawning two snakes. Keep these close to the node as you dodge attacks. Remember to interrupt high voltage. When the snakes die, they explode into a small AoE that puts a vulnerability up onto all nearby targets, including the node. Try to avoid being hit too. From this point, it's just a matter of dodging the AoEs you've seen over and over, and slowly knocking down the HP. You can kill before the snake vulnerabilities wear off. 16. Sunset Boulevard. Requirements? Any magic attack. Recommended. Number 7, Loom. Number 13, White Wind. The first act is a test of slide casting and playing it safe. If these Cyclops reach you, you will die so keep backing away and kill them both off. As a note for the second act, we bring White Wind only for safety for if we make a mistake. The second act is a lot more involved. Bring it to the middle when you pull it. The cow comes with all the usual Cyclops attacks like 10 tons slash in front of it. It will also use Voice of Authority to summon an ad you want to focus down. The boss will use 111 ton swing here, forcing you away from the boss and to the edge. Dodge away from the ad, and it will cross through the middle of the arena to reach you, giving you time to kill it off. Next is Cry of Rage, a simple gaze attack you look away for. Keep the cow near the edge from this point forward. Keep pushing it lower until it uses the bull's voice, increasing its damage. This leads into Predatorial Instinct. This will apply heavy to you, making it impossible to get away from 1,111 ton swing. Sprint can negate this heavy, or you can use the loom as intended. Stay at the edge of the arena and try to get the boss there too. Next is Zoom In, which is a far knockback, nearly the size of the arena diameter. Don't get knocked into the electricity, and you are free to kill it. If it continues to live due to mistakes like I make in this attempt, his attacks will gain further AoEs. But as long as you stay close, you'll live. 17. The Sword of Music. Requirements? Any magic attack. Any physical attack. Number 13, White Wind. Number 24, Flying Sardine. Recommended, Lightning-based attacks. Number 15, Sharpened Knife. Act 1 has two hands, both weak to lightning. However, one has Physical Reflect, and the other has Magic Reflect. You also must take on both at once. So while you likely can manage to separate the hands, you are most likely going to take on a lot of self-damage trying to kill one off. 
Focus down one or the other first, then safely take out the other that remains. Keep healing as needed and dodge the cone and line AoEs. At worst, sharpened knife to take out the physical hand first. Sharpened knife isn't AoE after all. In Act 2, we have one big Colossus. It uses Grand Strike, which will come in pairs. They are very thin AoEs, but very fast to go out. Similar to the last time we saw this guy, it will cast Magitek Field. Don't concern yourself with this, and immediately get to killing off the hands that spawn at the same time. During this ad phase, the Colossus will use Magitek Ray, which will leave behind a fire puddle. Just dodge, and continue to focus down the hands, while more Grand Strikes come out. After a bit, a second Magitek Field will be cast. Flying Sardine, this one away. Another Magitek Ray will go out. Don't bother interrupting this when you can dodge instead. Focus on taking down the boss's help while dodging anything else it throws out, and interrupt any further Magitek Fields. 18. Midsummer Knight's Explosion. Requirements? Any magic attack. Recommended? A magic attack that hits the enemy directly. This is a fun one, but basically the same in both acts. Drag the Manticore around the map, blowing up barrels as you go by damaging them or having the Manticore damage them. They have three attacks. Frontal Cleave, an aimed fire attack that has no AoE indicator, and a rush that pushes you back. Pay attention to the animations of the Manticore, and be careful not to stand in the barrel explosions. If the Manticore is still alive after all the barrels are gone, just spam attacks until it dies. We bring a targeted attack specifically for positioning reasons. If we can't reach them with line AoEs, or the barrels will be hit by accident, a targeted AoE solves both these issues. In Act 2, as I said, it's basically the same thing. They have seemingly less health, but make the process a lot more chaotic. You will usually get both Manticores in the same explosion, but it is possible that some barrels will only hit one due to their patterns being different. Take this into account as you dodge, as either one can shoot a fireball at you at a bad time. Also, barrels do count toward the kill count. They must all explode for you to finish the fight. 19. On a clear day, you can smell forever. Requirements. Any physical attack. Number 13. White Wind. Recommended. Number 24. Flying Sardine. The opening move of this... thing... is Reflect meaning we need to rely on physical attacks. This is otherwise a fight similar to all Morble fights. We have the slow casting, huge frontal cleave that is bad breath. Stay close at all times to avoid it. We also have Vine Probe, a large frontal line. The thing to potentially worry about is Opal Breath, a circular AoE aimed where you were standing. It can be interrupted, and if you don't, we'll leave behind a goo puddle. Not something to worry about for Act 1. Act 2 is mostly more of the same, but you'll be hurt a lot more and is where you will need a few white wins. You may also want to Flying Sardine the Oval Breath for the new mechanic, Skizzle Carps. This will summon a ton of adds that you can't kill. Stand at the edge of the electricity between two hips and look outside of the arena. The range of the gaze these give off is very narrow. You will immediately have to make an escape after the gaze goes off or be hit with bad breath. From here, it's just the same stuff. Dodge the AoEs and keep putting out damage. 20. Miss Typhon. Requirements. Any magic attack. Number 24, Flying Sardine. Number 29, Diamondback. Number 34, The Dragon's Voice. Recommended. Any fire magic. Number 8, Final Sting. Number 20, Off Guard. Number 39, Moon Flute. Number 64, Whistle. But Bristle is also an option. As you can tell from the skill list, this is the most involved fight yet. Starting with Typhon, she will push you back, then use Fireball. Just simply dodge and prepare for Snort. Partway through the cast, hit Diamond back and you will take very little damage. You die otherwise. Afterwards, Typhon will do a pushback, then repeat the entire pattern from the beginning. Even with only a basic attack, you can take out Typhon before the second Snort even begins to cast. If you're somehow too slow, just diamond back again. Act 2 brings in Ultros who is weak to fire. He's pretty basic. Aqua Breath is a frontal AoE. Megavolt is a large AoE around him. An Imp Song will turn you into an Imp. Just interrupt it. Then he'll start using Aqua Breath and Megavolt with randomly placed circular AoEs. Keep hitting him, 
dodging and interrupting his imp songs. He has far more HP than Typhon did. Finally, we have Act 3. Typhon returns. I highly recommend just doing a few basic attacks for safety, then preparing a final sting. Whistle slash bristle, moon flute, off guard, then final sting. This will give the secret achievement Octopath Traveler. I already had it, but you can see on screen I got the bonus of Trouble with Tentacles. We'll see what this is about now in another clip. This is where the requirements kick in, along with quite a bit of luck. Typhon follows the exact same pattern as before. Diamondback in the middle of the arena as soon as you see Snort is casting. Ultros will spawn as Snort begins casting and spawn four tentacles on the outside of the arena. The moment Diamondback ends, start spamming the dragon's voice and even swift cast the second one. It will take two casts to take them all out. If you don't kill them, you're going to have a huge issue. From here, it's just fighting both at once. Be sure to throw a fish anytime Imp Song is being cast and Diamondback any snorts. Ultros will most likely shoot off any of his AoEs during Diamondback, meaning you don't have to worry about his AoEs doing damage. You will still want to immediately use Diamondback when the snort begins casting, as Imp Song can overlap with Diamondback if you don't. Ignore Ultros otherwise and kill Typhon quick. Her HP is just that much lower than Ultros. Even trying to kill Ultros first may just kill off Typhon in the meantime. So, there's two options. Good luck if you decide to do the hard route. 21. Chimera on a hot tin roof. Requirements? Any magic attack. Number 24. Flying Sardine. Recommended? Any fire attack. First part, super easy. Just kill the enemies. Can Flying Sardine their Void Blizzard if desired, but it doesn't even punish you much. A fire attack will do much more damage. Act 2 is a normal Chimera. The Ram's voice, get away. The Dragon's voice, get in. He will also use the Ram's Keeper, which will place a large ice puddle on the ground if you let it go off. Just flying sardine it away, because these are seemingly permanent. Eventually, adds will start spawning. Take them out as they do, and keep an eye on which attack the Chimera is doing. Very little to this one. 22. Here comes the Boom. Requirements? Any magic attack. Act 1, just kill the bombs. The only worry is if you use a very, very weak skill. They will explode and kill you. Long as you use any normal skill, they will die in one hit. Act 2 actually has stuff to worry about. Scalding Scolding is a frontal AoE, and like all bomb matriarchs, we have Sap. Bait Sap towards the edge anytime you can, and run to the middle. This Sap comes with a bunch more AoEs after it lands. Only a small section of the arena will be safe. Run to it immediately. This will be followed with Bombshell Drop. This will summon an ad. The first time, the arena grenade from Act 1. Target it and kill it in one hit. You may want to stop hitting the boss for a moment, just because AoE damage drop off is enough that the bomb will not die. You will be given a bit of time before the boss casts Ignition. If the bomb is alive when Ignition goes off, you die. Deal with more scaldings and saps to get to the next bombshell drop. Around the arena, a blue bomb will spawn. Do not hit this gas bomb. Instead, run behind it and hit it towards the boss, and then leave it go. The boss will be very slowly casting burst to kill you. You must let the boss be hit by the gas bomb's attack flash thum to stop it. From here, mechanics will repeat. Kill grenades before ignition, bait sap towards the edge to make dodging the AoEs after easier, and push gas bombs to the boss. 23. Behemoths and Broomsticks. Requirements? Any magic attack. Number 13, White Wind. Number 29, Diamondback. This is your typical behemoth, which means it has a bunch to deal with. Charybdis is a wind AoE that will occasionally pulse larger. This will be comboed directly into Trounce, a large cone AoE. Aim it outside the arena where you can. Then it will use Comet combined with Trounce. Move to the safe spots wherever they appear, as comets are pretty random. Two sets of comets will fall. He will repeat this again. Try and be as close as you can to the first Charybdis, as both will be on the arena for a bit longer. He will Charybdis into comets with trounces, then cast Ecliptic Meteor. Diamondback this to survive, then White Wind to heal up. Even with Diamondback, this hurts. He will use Comet again after, but this will contain three sets of comets. From here, mechanics will just repeat over and over. 
He just has a lot of health to chop through. 24. Amazing Technicolor Pit Fiends. Requirements? Any magic attack. Any physical attack. Number 13, White Wind. Number 24, Flying Sardine. Number 29, Diamondback. The first act is just to introduce you to the concept of needing physical attacks for the mage dolls and magic attacks for the warrior dolls. They do some basic targeted AoEs and cones. Take one out at a time and move on to Act 2. Act 2 is here to force Flying Sardine to dodge Silence and Diamondback to block Condensed Libra into Triple Hit. Triple Hit hurts a little bit even with Diamondback thanks to that Voln up. The boss will begin to cast Mechanogravity regularly and spawn pairs of adds with a bit less regularity. Take them out the same way as Act 1 and get back to the boss. Act 3 is completely different. Keep him towards the edge as much as you can. Page Tear is a frontal cleave with no AoE marker, just like Manticore's in previous fights. Magic Hammer is a large AoE centered on you, but slow cast. Gale Cut will randomly place wind currents around the arena. He will follow this into Head Down. Get as close as you can to the boss and aim yourself towards any empty spaces. You will be knocked back about half the length of the arena and be targeted with Magic Hammer. You want lots of leeway to dodge both the wind and the Magic Hammer. Next, Bone Shaker will spawn more adds. Kill these ASAP and dodge anything the boss does. If you are slow to kill the adds, they will jump on you and explode. From here, it's all repeat mechanics. Chase down adds after Bone Shaker, dodge AoEs that get sent at you, and be sure to keep the boss on the edge for any gale cuts. 25. Dirty Rotten Azomagia. Requirements. Any magic attack. Any physical attack. Number 7. Loom. Recommended. An attack of every element and all three physical damage types. To merely beat the fight, you only need a magical attack, a physical attack, and loom. The hidden achievement for this fight requires a bit more to complete. You need to damage him with one attack of every element, one of every physical type of attack, which is piercing, slashing, and blunt, and you also need loom still. You also cannot be hit by any avoidable damage and clear under the listed part time. This run through will be doing this achievement, Perfect Blue. We'll still be seeing every mechanic. Act 1 will have Azormagia open with Ice Spikes, making all physical attacks do reflected damage. Stick to just magic for this entire act. He will begin to cycle through a lot of moves that all just need practice to dodge. Apocalyptic Bolt is a simple line AoE toward you, but is pretty big. Then he'll become a Chimera, using the Ram's voice and the Dragon's voice. Like always, get out for Ram, get in for Dragon. When he is not using the Ram's voice, stay as close as possible as you can manage. Continue to dodge the bolts until Plane Cracker comes out. This starts with an AoE around Azomagia, like Ram's voice, but then causes two randomly placed huge donut AoEs, and then a set of much smaller donuts. You have very little time to react, but try to point Azomagia away from the safe spots for Apocalyptic Roar. This may trip you up the first time with how fast this all comes out, and how random the AoE placements are. This will be the main part you have to learn for all of this fight. From here, just finish him off while avoiding attacks. Act 2 begins with him using Repelling Spray. You must rely on physical attacks for this entire phase. After an Apocalyptic Bolt, he will summon two Blazing Anguns. These should be taken down immediately with your physical attacks. They enrage quickly and should only take one attack each. From there, it's just about dodging the same attacks as before. He will do nothing new. If he begins to summon Blazing Angons again and isn't about to die, shift your focus to taking those out before finishing him off. Act 3 will have Azomagia swapping between Repelling Spray and Ice Spikes, starting with Repelling Spray. He will then cycle through his attacks normally. Handle them all the same, staying close. The first new thing will be Charybdis, placing four tornadoes around the arena. Aim the following Apocalyptic Bolt anywhere you want, then head to the edge of the arena between two tornadoes for Web. Web reduces your movement speed to almost zero. Standing at the edge of the arena for this helps us bait the next attack, Meteor. This is a very large AoE that also leaves behind a fire puddle. Use Loom twice to get out of this. After Meteor, he will swap to Ice Spikes. Be careful here and hold your attacks until after it finishes casting, then swap to Magic. Now for the final push, Plane Cracker will go out. This one is the Double Donuts, 
plus an apocalyptic bolt. Between the Charybdis and the Puddle, there is very little room for movement. This may take a few tries to get a good pattern and proper movement around the tornadoes. He will follow it up with another double plane cracker and apocalyptic roar. During this cast, Charybdis will end and give you more room to breathe. Afterwards, the arena should clear up and it becomes a matter of just finishing him off. Congrats on Perfect Blue if you brought the setup and avoided everything. 26. Papa Mia. Requirements? Any non-lightning attack. Number 13, White Wind. Number 24, Flying Sardine. Number 57, Eerie Soundwave. Number 73, Exuviation. Recommended? Any Earth attack. Now we're in Heavensward tier fights. They expect Heavensward tier skills. The boss opens with alternate plumage, which makes itself near impossible to kill. Use Eerie Soundwave to remove the buff. Cave Toss will instantly murder you without Flying Sardine to interrupt it. For a bit, he will stop using skills, but puts out insane DPS. White Wind is needed, and prepare for Gust. This is a fast, but very small AoE to dodge multiple times. From here, mechanics will repeat, and you just need to do the same things to avoid them. Papa here in Act 2 is immune to electricity, so this is why we might as well use an Earth spell. Rot Instinct is this act's requirement for Eerie Soundwave. He will hit very hard otherwise. Body Blow hurts even without the buff. Void Thunder 2 is a small AoE that summons a cloud that will repeatedly explode into large AoEs. Stay very far away from these, and drag Papa around the edge of the arena. He will use this a second time, and the first cloud will soon after move toward you. This drags it to the edge and prepares you for Dad Joke. Point yourself to the middle of the room when the arrow appears above your head, and you'll be knocked to the opposite side. Heal up after and get moving when the clouds once again move to your spot. Papa's final trick is Void Thunder 3. This does light damage, but puts a very heavy dot on you. Use Exuviation to clear it, and move when the clouds move one final time. From here, mechanics will repeat. Kite Papa and the clouds around the edge, remove any buffs and debuffs, keep yourself healed, and he will fall. 27. Lock up your snorters. Requirements? Number 1. Water Cannon. Number 31. Sticky Tongue. Recommended. Number 97. Hydro Pull. This is the worst fight in the entire carnival. The main goal per phase is to prevent the bombs from blowing up the mines. Use Sticky Tongue on the bomb closest to the mine and drag it to a different direction. Typhon will snort and push all bombs to the edges of the arena, and also you. Move the bomb out of the way and immediately start killing the mine. It has a tight enrage timer, but also don't stand too close to the mine, because Typhon will also throw a fireball at you. This can blow the mine up too. After a second fireball, there will be a second pattern of bombs and a mine. These bombs cannot hit the mine, so it's all safe. Just kill the mine, standing well toward the edge to bait fireballs and not be hit by Funga. Wait for the third pattern. It will be eight bombs with no mines. These bombs are the only real way to damage her. This is a free phase for using Sticky Tongue to drag the bombs to her. And so that's the fight. It repeats from there. Kill off mines, draw bombs to Typhon to damage her. It takes eight bombs to kill her if you don't do enough DPS to account for an entire bomb. What I recommend, meanwhile, is to just not do this fight until level 70 and get Hydro Pool. On the 8 bomb pattern, wait for Funga, then swift cast Hydro Pool in the direct center of the arena. This will destroy Typhon instantly. 28. Dangerous Wind Dead. Requirements? Any magic attack. Number 13, White Wind. Number 24, Flying Sardine. Recommended? Any fire spell? Maybe number 19? Bomb Toss. This is a repeat of the Forgall boss from Weeping City of Mock, essentially, but with a lot more mechanics. Whenever Doom Impending is being cast, White Wind to get back to max HP. If you are max HP, Doom will auto-cleanse. Next is March of the Draugr, which summons adds. The first time is a group of eight mummies. They hurt a lot, but Bomb Toss stuns them. Heal yourself as needed and burn them down. Be wary of Cackle as you do. This hurts and should be interrupted with Flying Sardine ASAP. After a moment is Necrobane, a slow AoE that leaves behind a puddle. This is followed by Megadeth. At the end of the cast bar, get into the puddle. You will not be able to survive Megadeth unless you are inside the puddle. 
Notice the glow around the boss is different and the slow cast time. He'll finish off with Hellblar Shriek, which is just basic AoE damage. Next is a March of the Draugr of four soldiers. They stand in the electricity and damage you very hard. Bomb Toss should kill them in one hit while you heal up as needed. Avoid the Necrobane Puddle and watch the cast. It's the same sparkly animation as Megadeth, but it isn't Megadeth. Funeral Pyre is a trick to get you to go into the puddle. Heal up after it hits. There will be another Shriek, followed by the third March of the Draugr. This will be four undead warriors that also hurt a lot. Be ready to heal a lot and kill off the ads before Brainstorm needs your attention. Brainstorm will give you a debuff of a forced march. Your character will be forced to walk in that direction, based on which direction your character is currently facing. From the middle of the arena, aim your character towards the safe spot. You will automatically walk to it. If you are off-centered, you may need to take a step afterwards to avoid the AoEs. One more Heblar Shriek, and the final march of the Draugr will go out. Only two Gravekeepers, but they have a lot of HP and still hurt a lot. They walk slow so you can do some slight kiting, but it is still very limited. Kite them around the edge of the arena and heal as needed. From here you'll start seeing the other mechanics repeat. Doom Impending, Megadeth, Cackle, and everything else. Deal with the mechanics as they come, and don't worry about any more ads. That truly was the final set of ads. 29. Red, Fraught, and Blue. Requirements, any magic attack. Number 13, White Wind. Number 24, Flying Sardine. Number 29, Diamondback. Number 73, Exuviation. Recommended, any wind attack and any lightning attack. Highly recommend making use of Act 1's wind weakness. This is a hard carnival fight and every advantage you can get is very nice. The opening is Fluid Swing, requiring an interrupt from Flying Sardine. After a moment will be Sea of Flames. This is like Ifrit Eruptions. Get out of the cracked ground areas as they will explode. There will be two of them. Pyretic is simple. Stop doing everything. You take damage for every action you do while Pyretic is up. While the debuff is up, Fire 2 will begin to cast. Wait for Pyretic to fall off before moving. You have time. After an auto or two will be Pillar of Flame. It will always alternate inside and outside safe spots, so stay near the edge for most of the fight. Be ready to dodge whichever comes first, but also be ready for Rush. This is an unavoidable AoE that does more damage the closer you are to the boss. Run at least half the arena away to survive, but go all the way to the edge for what comes next. Flare Star will make an exploding fireball in the center that also does damage based on proximity. You will receive very little damage on the edge, but be ready to heal anyway. This explosion will summon three tornadoes. Do not stand in these. They will cast Fire Blast line AoEs at your position. Make your way to the open quarter of the arena and stand near one of the tornadoes. While doing so, interrupt Fluid Swing. The second set of Fire Blasts will be paired with Pillar of Flame. If you aim them all next to the tornado, the open side of the arena will have a nice safe spot. Remember that there's always two Pillars of Flame back to back and head towards middle, but while keeping the boss near the edge. A third set of Fire Blasts will be paired with Rush. Aiming them roughly down the middle will allow you to run straight to the edge of the arena next to a tornado. This marks the end of the tornado phase, and when you should run to the middle of the arena. One final pillar of flame pattern will be introduced. Only a small area near the edge will be safe, and where this spot is, is random. The middle of the arena is the safest place to be until it appears. From here, all mechanics will repeat. Take him down and enter Act 2. Act 2 is even harder than the first and shares some of the same mechanics. Being water-based, Lightning has extra effect here and is deeply wanted. Protean Wave will do two AoEs. First, a cone towards your direction. Dodge this. The AoE only appears at the end of the cast, but it is always in front of the boss. The second is an unavoidable bit of damage. Throttle will come next and will kill you if you do not Exuviation to cleanse the debuff. Also be sure to heal. After a moment will be Pharaoh Fluid. These are magnets. Remember the rules. Opposites attract, and the same will repel. If you have the opposite polarity, get far away. If you have the same polarity, stand on top of him. The AoE you must avoid will follow these rules too. Fluid Ball will chase you with two AoEs. 
Just keep moving after the first AoE goes out, and prepare to use Flying Sardine for the interrupt. Get him low enough to start his next phase. Now things get hard. Watery Grass will spawn two adds that hurt a lot. Immediately burst down the small one, then the big one. If the adds live for too long, they will cast a spell to eat 5,000 MP from your pool, and the small one begins to cast sooner than the large one, so kill the small one, then the big one, and then Flying Sardine to interrupt another fluid swing. This is likely the hardest part of the fight to get down, and involves a lot of kiting so the big hand doesn't murder you. Be sure to heal up anytime it does murder you. Use Diamondback to block Big Splash. This will hit heavily four times, even with Diamondback, so heal up for Cascade. A raid wide that will spawn three tornadoes randomly around the arena edges. Much like in the first act, these will shoot AoEs at you, but of a conal shape this time. So try and be near the tornadoes to minimize their effect. The first Protean waves will be paired with Fluid Swing from the boss. The second set will be followed up with a Protean wave from the boss. And then the third will be followed with a Fluid Ball. While being chased by the Fluid Ball AoEs, move to the point of the arena furthest away from the tornadoes. They will all explode and do proximity damage. At the same time as the explosions, the boss will do Throttle into Fluid Swing. Immediately begin to cast Exuviation when it hits, and then Flying Sardine the Fluid Swing. The timing is very tight, so don't let yourself go into the tornado explosions with low HP. And then the mechanics will repeat. Follow the magnet rules for Ferro Fluid and such, and Undertow should fall before the next big splash. If he doesn't, just diamond back and you'll have time before the next set of tornadoes. 30. The Catch of the Sea Creed. Requirements? Any magic attack. Any physical attack. Number 73, Exuviation. Recommended, an attack of every element, all three physical damage types, and more. Just like Perfect Blue, we have the Celestium's Finest. It has all the same requirements. Do damage with one of every element, one of every physical type, take no damage, and beat within the par time. That is a new requirement too. In Act 3, you must kill all adds that appear, but that is recommended anyway. Act 1 is our intro. He will open with Magic Drain, giving him a 30 second reflect to magic. Switch to physical attacks until it runs out. This is followed by Ankle Graze, which will bind you in place. Exuviation is how we get free. Do it as soon as possible to prep for Hyperdrive. This will target your position four times. Try and stay towards the middle of the arena as you lead the explosions. Siegfried will randomly jump to a cardinal direction and cast Magitek Explosive. Eight bombs will drop, and there will be one safe spot opposite of him. This always seems to be to his left the first three times this mechanic goes out. Stand right next to the bomb directly in front of Siegfried and have his rubber bullet attack push you to the safe spot. Aim your camera towards it too, as you may need to adjust slightly. From here, the mechanics just repeat. He won't magic drain again, but he will cycle through ankle graze, hyperdrive, explosives, and rubber bullet until he falls. As I said, the first three cycles all seem to place the spot to his left. The fourth cycle will be on the right. Act 2 is where you likely will make your first mistake. Law of the Torch is a three-pronged cone AoE. Dodge out of the middle cone to be between two cones and push towards the middle. We want to be mid for Swift Steel. A light knockback followed by a donut and several randomly placed AoEs. Adjust as needed to be pushed towards a safe spot. Stick towards the edge of the safe spot and Siegfried will jump to you for Spark Steel, doing an AoE around him. This leaves behind a small fire puddle and summons two sets of larger fire AoEs in random spots. Avoid the larger explosions and deal with Shatter Steel. He will do a large AoE around himself and explode all the ice shards around him. Look for the empty spot in the circle of ice and head to the very edge of the arena. The random fire AoEs and the fire AoE you placed can all be in the way of reaching this safe spot. This is why you may want Sprint and why you want to keep the fire puddle at the edge of the Swift Steel AoE. You have room to walk around it while also leaving the middle of the arena open. Siegfried will randomly jump around, spamming Law of the Torch until he begins the pattern again. Practice up on Shatter Steel, as that's the big sticking point for this fight, and especially Act 3. Siegfried is done playing nice for Act 3. He opens with Magic Drain again, so throw out some physical attacks. He will then jump mid for Magitek Decoy. He will summon an Ice Weak Add. 
These ads must be killed for his perfect blue requirements. Focus this ad down even if you aren't going for the achievement, as he and Siegfried will both be using attacks. Siegfried will hyperdrive, but only will explode once, while the clone uses Swift Steel. Right before Swift Steel resolves, Siegfried will jump and use Law of the Torch. Run to any of the safe spots made and quickly finish off the ad. It will use Law of the Torch a few times too, but you can kill it before these come out. With the ad gone, Siegfried will go back to Ankle Graze and Hyperdrive. Exuviation it away and dodge the added Law of the Torch. Prepare for Phase 2. The second clone is Wind Week. Be slightly off-center to place the clone's Spark Steel AoE while Siegfried uses Hyperdrive. They then will both spam Law of the Torch. This is by far the easiest part, more of a breather before the finale. Deal with another Ankle Graze and Hyperdrive combo and prepare for Phase 3. Phase 3 begins with Siegfried using Magic Drain. Be careful with taking out the ad, because if you hit Siegfried, you will regret it. This one is Fire Week. Siegfried will hyperdrive a single time, while the clone uses Shatter Steel. Head to the safe spot and be immediately ready to dodge Law of the Torch. There is a little bit of time, but it's a tight shave. I have also seen Law of the Torch go off before Shatter Steel. I do not know what causes this, but it has cost me an attempt before. Perhaps a bug that has been fixed. From here, both will use Law of the Torch a few times before the ad falls. And then it's just repeating mechanics until Siegfried falls. He will even bring back Magitek Explosive from Act 1. Keep pushing and you might kill in time for the achievement. Ignoring that AoE that barely touched me because I was being dumb, I barely missed the par time. With some crits and missing no attack opportunities, it may be possible to do it but bring more firepower than this minimum anyway. Perhaps bring Final Sting for a huge burst of damage in Act 1 or 2. 31. Anything Go-Go's. Requirements. Any attack. Number 13, White Wind. Number 24, Flying Sardine. Number 29, Diamondback. Number 57, Eerie Sound Wave. Number 73, Exuviation. Recommended. Everything you have. Gogo -Go is a huge difficulty increase depending on how you do it. Those requirements are real. You do not need anything but those six skills. Anything more is beyond the minimum. However, you will be much smarter to bring way more. It's not like the other fights where you simply shorten the fight. This one is just far more than even Azulmagia and Siegfried. This is the only fight for the Stormblood section, and you should bring absolutely everything to bear for this one. High level gear, as many skills as you can get, and basically every possible primal skill if you want to go for pure azure. That is to say, the secret achievement. You must take zero vulnerability stacks and clear within the required par time. A par time that is impossible to reach with the minimum requirements, by far. You will need quite a bit for doing it in a fast enough time. So much so, you might as well simply do good enough and clear until you can do what I do in the nuke part of the guide. Collecting the overpowered spells is probably less effort, especially since it's part of the point of Blue Mage. Collect them all. For specific recommendations, I suggest number 58 Palm Cure and number 77 Etheric Mimicry. If you mimic a healer, you can skip out on White Wind for a much more MP efficient way of healing. You will need to heal a lot in almost every way you tackle this fight. Otherwise, bring any and all primal skills you have for higher damage. Maybe prepare a Final Sting combo for Phase 2. While you're at it, number 50 Bristle is pretty decent for Act 1. Also, I've not mentioned basically any of your roll actions so far. Adel is going to be useful for reducing damage, and you need to keep Lucid Dreaming on cooldown. If you don't, your MP will quickly run out. Let's actually get into the fight now with that minimum toolkit. Start with a few cheap hits on Gogo, -Go, then stop attacking completely. You can use heals and buffs, but any attack on Gogo -Go will enrage him and instantly kill you. Anytime he casts Mimic, follow his lead by recovering and buffing instead of fighting. When Mimic falls, the real fight begins. Any burst you have set up, use now and prepare for a lot of mechanics. Flamethrower is a basic conal AoE he uses regularly for forcing you to constantly heal. The first real mechanic is Mimicked Sap. Sap will explode three times, appearing where you are standing. You must be moving before the second or third AoE even appear to dodge those two. You can get in one cast between each sap goes off. 
This will be followed by a mimicked imp song. Just like Ultros, throw a fish. Get healing after this as soon will be mimicked doom impending. If you are not max HP when this finishes casting, you die. This will be followed with another mimic. Buff and heal during this as well and prepare for mimicked Bunshin to summon a clone. The clone will use a cross between Protean Wave and Law of the Torch. When aimed at you, it actually will miss you as the empty spot between the prongs is in the middle. At the same time, the main Gogo -Go will use Mimicked Fire Blast and align toward you. Essentially, you want to make a cross shape with these two. The clone will shoot the safe spot at you, and the perpendicular line AoE from Gogo -Go will be easily dodged out of. Mimicked Raw Instinct follows, and is our required use of Eerie Sound Wave. From there, Mimics will repeat, but seemingly with the exception of Mimicked Bunshin. Handle each one the same as before and finish him off as soon as you can but save Burst for the next phase, ideally. Act 2 is what we did all our preparations for. Mimic is gone, but in its place are a slew of new attacks you will use back-to-back -back for an opener. Gogo Fire 3 is an AoE that applies Pyretic. Get away from Gogo whenever you see this cast. He will always follow it up with Gogo Blizzard 3, which is a large AoE all around him. You can't move once Gogo Fire 3 goes off, since Pyretic does damage to you for taking action while it is up. It also often just damages you anyway. This is followed into Go Go Thunder 3, just to showcase what it does before the fight truly begins. It leaves behind a puddle, so dodge and stay out. His opener will finish off with Go Go Flare into Go Go Holy. These both hit very hard and should be healed through. Addle is a good option here. When Go Go jumps to the middle, he will cast Go Go Meteor, which comes with a lot of Go Go Comets and Fire Explosions. Go Go Media has three meteors to deal with, the first is a proximity marker that always appears to the east. Get to the west side of the map and dodge all the comets. Then do the opposite. The second media will be west, so run east. Get to the edge and cast Diamondback for an unavoidable third media that will do major damage even when under Diamondback. You may need to practice this phase a few times before you get it down. Marking east and west with arena markers could also help you remember the media landing order. The main issue is the large fire AoEs that spawn. You have time to move into position to dodge the proximity markers, but I recommend you also swift cast into Diamondback. This can reduce the damage of the second media as well as last into the unavoidable media hit. Next is Charybdis, which will place two tornadoes at opposite into Cardinals of the Arena. If you got to the east edge like you wanted to, you don't need to move. He will then cast Ice Storm, then waste some time casting a second Charybdis. Use Exuviation twice when Ice Storm finishes. It puts both a dot and a heavy on you. Heal up too and get as close to the edge as possible. Gogo -Go will use Gogo -Go Thunder 3, well, three times. Place these close together and move toward the other side of the arena away from Gogo. -Go. He will use Gogo -Go Fire 3 into Gogo -Go Blizzard 3, just like at the start of the fight. So you need to use the Thunder 3s to put distance between you both. I recommend zooming in your camera a bunch to not get blinded by the Charybdis animations. And then the fight will loop starting from Gogo -Go Flare and Gogo -Go Holy. That's right, only two major mechanics, but both of them are extremely busy. If you did not go for heal and mimicry, be sure to absolutely spam Lucid Dreaming to have enough MP for every loop of Gogo -Go Meteor. Like I've said, this will last a very long time without a proper high damage toolkit, and Diamondback alone is an extremely expensive 3000 MP. 31. A Golden Opportunity Requirements Any Physical Attack Number 7 Loom Number 13 White Wind Number 24 Flying Sardine Number 29 Diamondback Number 33 The Ram's Voice Number 73 Exuviation Number 92 Ultra Vibration. Recommended. Send. In. Everyone. Now, unlike Gogo, -Go, we have no time requirements to worry about for the special achievement. For all that glitters is blue, time is instead a measure of how many mechanics we have to face. The going for gold bonus is merely... Win. That. Never sprint. Do not kill the ad in Act 2. And you will need to bring in one of every elemental attack. You do not need every physical type like a Zolmagia. If you've beaten Gogo, -Go, you almost certainly have that requirement covered. Bring one of each along. Otherwise, once again, 
This requirement list is the bare minimum to clear, but every additional skill you bring along is a huge, huge help. Especially with how overpowered you will see we become in the nuke part of the guide. But let's get into this pure minimal run. I will at most be bringing in enough to show the achievement is possible under such minimal circumstances. The first action Goldor takes is Goldor Blizzard 3. This must be interrupted or you will just die. Goldor Fire 3, meanwhile, is a very large set of chasing AoEs. Just run around the edge of the arena and you will naturally dodge them, and the Goldor Blast line AoE sent your way. Get in some damage and await Slimy Summon. This summons an Ice Weak Slime in the center of the arena. What this actually means is you need to freeze it with any attacks that freeze, then use Ultra Vibration to kill it. The Ram's voice is here specifically for that freezing part. But careful while you do, as Goldor Quake will do cascading AoEs, starting from Goldor. Dodge into the circle after the indicator disappears, and take care of the slime. Goldor Fire will spawn a bunch of Wind Weak adds. Focus just one of them down, and you will have done enough. Dodge the Goldor Blast while you do, and position yourself between Goldor and the fire you killed. Goldor Arrow 3 will knock you back. Adjust if you are not in the small safe spot, and the other fires will explode. Goldor Blast will be aimed right at you, so dodge to the side as soon as they do. Goldor Gravity is more an annoyance than a danger. It hurts decently and applies a heavy, meaning you can't dodge anymore. This is why we need a loom. You could sprint through this, but that would disqualify you from the achievement. Just loom to behind Goldor to dodge the blast. Next is Goldor Thunder 3 with some Goldor Blasts. Thunder 3 places a 60 second dot on you that you need to remove with Exuviation, or White Wind Spam through. Exuviation is a required skill anyway to get this far, so just use that. He'll use Goldor Blizzard 3 again, and now he stops playing fair. Goldor Fire will be used along with Goldor Thunder 3. Using only a basic attack spell, you probably can only just barely kill a fire in time. This time, you have to deal with random AoEs and a dot to Exuviation. Arguably, this makes the requirements that you need something extra to kill flames from now on. But technically, you can kill with just the main spell, if you are lucky. I say I recommend as much as you can bring for a reason. Just bring more. Maybe even a spammable wind spell. After another Goldor Gravity will be the final mechanic, Goldor Fire 3 combined with Goldor Quake. Assuming you kept Goldor on the edge of the arena, run in an arc toward the middle of the arena. This will give you enough space to run all the way around Goldor. This keeps you close and allows you to bait every fire explosion behind you. Everything will just repeat in a set order now. Keep pushing your damage, heal as needed, and make sure you can kill the flames every time they come up. Remember, he's going to be putting Thunder 3 dots on you very often, while you have to deal with fires. Act 2, things really get going. The main mechanic is a Shining Summon in various forms. The first is four golems that do large cross AoEs. Goldor Arrow 3 will push you away from him. Aim for roughly next to one of the golems and take an extra step or two back. This will put you into one of the safe spots. Shining Summon 2 is four dolls on intercardinals. Head to where a golem was standing for Goldor Quake. Dodge inside after the first hit. Try not to move into the overlap of all four dolls AoEs and Diamondback. You cannot dodge this. You must take the damage of two of the dolls. This will do around a little bit under half your health. Be ready to heal up instantly. Shining Summon 3 is a single Cyclops. Goldor Thunder 3 is matched with the Cyclops sucking you in. Try an Exuviation in the tiny window between the cast and the inhale, as you now have a 60 second Thunder Dot on you again. That or a Swift Cast Exuviation. Random AoEs will be going out as you get sucked in, and you must run to the edge of the arena immediately. If you don't, the Cyclops will hit you with a Swing AoE. Dodge all the AoEs and you will get into the real fight. Goldor Fever will power Goldor up to be immune to magic, which is why I specify a physical attack is required. You have two options. Hit the crystal with a few physical attacks to get your toolkit, or relegate yourself to physical attacks for the rest of the fight. Goldor's achievement says you can't kill the crystal, so... Looks like we're playing the long game. Shining Summon will from now on be all of them at once, which also makes it way easier because the doll version is gone. Try to keep Goldor near the middle of the arena as he will start to spam Goldor Blast. The second one will go off as the Cyclops sucks you in. Aim this laser away from the doll, then run to the sides of it. Both the left and right of the doll will be safe at the edge of the arena. 
Dodge the third blast aimed directly at you as you head toward the middle. He'll hit you with a bunch of auto attacks before using Goldor Gravity again. This is exactly the same as in Act 1. Then he'll use Goldor Blizzard 3. Throw a sardine. And now we have Goldor Rush. This is Goldor Arrow 3, Fire 3, Thunder 3, Quake, and Blast all at the same time. This takes a bit to parse. The Fire 3 is a pair of targeted explosions based on your positioning. The first one is placed based on where you are standing when the cast bar ends. The second is placed about when the first explosion goes off. So you cannot get pushed back and stay still. You have to move. That and because Goldoy Blast is pointed right at you. Thunder 3 is randomly hitting the arena and can basically make it impossible to dodge in some patterns. Dodge toward whatever empty spots you can see and be ready to immediately curve into the middle when Quake goes off. Luckily, he fills in the rest of the time just spamming Blast at you, which is free damage. This will lead into him repeating mechanics over and over. The same Shining Summon pattern into everything else. The main issue is going to be Goldor Rush every time it comes around. You want to minimize the number of loops of this you have to deal with. MP shouldn't be an issue, even with constantly requiring heals. It's all a matter of just executing and keeping the damage going. The more skills you bring, the more you can cut down your time and just win. Congrats and enjoy your achievement. But now we come to the second part of the guide, the nuke part. Before we begin, let's go over some basic rules. This is my basic toolkit going into these fights, with plenty of room to adjust. As you can see, I have pointless stuff like Angel Whisper. I'm alone, I don't need that. Song of Torment is pointless as most stuff dies instantly. As is Mortal Flame for that same reason. Takes a minute to be worth it. I'm not going to be naming all these. You can see them and see the numbers and icons. Should be easily viewable even on a phone. Point is, I bring in the dot opener and just... Kill. One, all's well that starts well. Two, much ado about pudding. Literally free. Three, waiting for Golem. This guy has some decent HP, but basic dodging will kill him. Four, gentlemen prefer swords. Three, I spend more time making mistakes than the enemies did anything. Five, the three penny turtles. The ram's voice, ultra vibration. Six, I society. Three, seven, a chorus slime. Sadly, this one requires you to play it completely normally. The Ice Sprites have far more HP than is worth. Same thing for Act 2. 8. Bombardy of Errors. Free. Can also Ultra Vibration, I think? 9. To kill a Mocking Slime. This fight talks about a slime. There is no slime here. 10. A little night music. If you want the achievement, remember to lower it to about 45% HP and wait for the third cast of his buff. Then you can hit super hard. Bring Sardine just in case for Nebula. 11. Some like it excruciatingly hot. Hydro Pool clears Act 2 basically for free. 12. The Plantum of the Opera. It's still faster to bring Ice Spikes than to kill the flowers normally. The Act 2 boss has a good chunk of HP too. He'll last a bit beyond a Super Nuke opener, maybe even needing an Ice Spikes for their ads. 13. Beauty and a Beast. All I see is corpses. 14. Blobs in the Woods. Pop sprint and run around the back of the cube. Being mortal's long cast time gives you a free trip back there while killing the front two slimes. Then kill these two at the same time and Diamondback. You will die without it, but plenty of time to use it. 15. The Mean Nobody Nodes. Depending on how hard and how fast you kill the node, it might skip its opening high voltage. You don't even need to interrupt it if it does go off. Just kill the node. 16. Sunset Boulevard. Let's have some steak. 17. The Sword of Music. Sadly, due to Act 1, you need to play it slightly safe. Maybe bring a single target physical skill or two for killing the Magic Reflect Hand. Act 2, just go crazy. Just make sure after Moon Flute ends, you don't worry about the ads. Safely finish off the boss. 18. Midsummer Night's Explosion. You will literally spend more time killing the barrels than you do killing the manticores. Try to save AoE skills for Act 2 so you can kill both off. Then just take out the barrels manually. 19. On a clear day, you can smell forever. I smell dead marbles. 20. Miss Typhon. Typhon has, like, 
no HP at all still. Your goal here is to hit Act 2 with as much as you can. Ultros is so much beefier. All your extra skills you can use to quickly end Acts 1 and 3. 21, Chimera on a hot tin roof. 22, here comes the boom. 23, Behemoths and Broomsticks. Free kills. 24, Amazing Technicolor Pit Fiends. Remember that Act 1 requires a physical attack for one of the enemies. That's it. 25, Dirty Rotten Azul Magia. It's actually harder to do the achievement like this. He dies so fast, you might forget to use all your skills. Try and use everything before Act 3, on the chance you forget to. 26, Papa Mia. Both acts you need to care about. The Mirror Knight can one-shot you if it gets to Kabatos, and Papa has you wanting to use Eerie Soundwave. Otherwise, pretty free. 27, Lock up your Snorters. You can use part of your opener to focus down the first mine. Do as much damage as you can. Then in the second set of bombs, you can just hydro pull like normal. Though without penalty if you hit the mine. 28. Dangerous Wind Dead. Fit White Wind into your opener. Smartly save something to kill the first set of adds, and you can do a final sting finisher. 29. Red, Fra, and Blue. Unfortunately, this one is still pretty annoying. We have to fit Flying Sardine into our opener, and it only takes about half of the Fireman's health. Some healing and maybe a spammable wind spell might speed this up decently. We cannot Moonflute the opener because of needing Exuviation before the debuff wears off. I don't even bother and just handle this guy's mechanics as normal. You can probably kill him before Big Splash, but I instead play it all safe and get through it. I end in the Water Tornadoes instead. 30. The Catch of the Siegfried. You may need to adjust your opener a bit for some of these. Act 1 will quickly put up a Magic Reflect, so make that your first attack or two, then relegate fully to physical. You can kill him before Hyperdrive goes off. What you didn't use on Act 1, kill Act 2 with. Remember the achievement for this fight requires you to kill all three adds in Act 3. Do a basic opener if you wish, but you need to intentionally do poor DPS to let him live long enough. You also need to watch for Exuviation uses. Also, be a bit careful of his Reflect during the clone. Maybe pull out your physical attacks to kill it. Otherwise, get him low on HP while you wait, but don't accidentally kill him. 31. Anything go-goes. Don't do your opener immediately in Act 1. Just do a basic opener and prep your true opener during Mimic. The moment it goes down, hit him as hard as you can with a full opener. You need to hit Moon Flute when there's about 5 seconds left on Mimic. This is because of the debuff afterwards. Only when timed correctly will Waning Nocturne fall off before Gogo uses Mimicked Imp Song. Mash that flying sardine button and finish off Gogo before Mimicked Doom Impending. Act 2, once again, do not do a Moon Flute opener. Gogo Fire 3 will interrupt it immediately and then Flare into Holy will need some healing. Then you have to deal with Meteor. Use whatever extras you have while pushing through it to damage Gogo. After Ice Storm and your double Exuviation, now you can Moon Flute and destroy Gogo. I even lightly mess up and nearly get him killed. Quickly finish him off after. 32, a golden opportunity. Honestly, this is mostly the same as the fight normally. Get Flying Sardine in the opener and just chop at his HP. I bring in Cold Fog for some extra greed to kill the slime and hurt the boss. If you do it as fast as possible, you can even skip the flames phase. Otherwise, loom through gravity and he should fall just shortly after. Act 2, again, more of the same. Try and get him as low as possible before he pulls up the crystal. I also play it super safe here and push through Goldor Rush, because this took me a long time to get down right. Because every time I went to do Final Sting, I got extremely low damage rolls. It can do upwards of 20% of its HP, but at that point, you're risking crit RNG. If you can survive one gold or rush, you're pretty safe. And that covers every fight in the Masked Carnival as of Endwalker, both in a minimal and nuke way. Given what happened between Shadowbringers and this one, I may end up just making a completely new guide about this. Either way, check the description for the updated guide. 
check the comments for alternate solutions. Please rate, comment, subscribe, check my socials, check out my Twitch, my Patreon, my merch. All of it please and thank. Blue Mage is cool, and so will you be for checking out any of these. Take care, and may the power of Anna Nidhogg slay waste to your enemies. And thank you to all my patrons over on Patreon, with an extra special thanks going out to... Altrios, Eamon al Khatib, Benjamin Hahn, Benjamin Rice, Bergie, Ethan W, Fraser97, Jeremy Abbott, Jericho, Mizella, Shana, Shimmering Blaze, T Rogue, Timmy, and Zero Two. Thank you for watching. This took a long time. See you for the next one for hopefully something shorter.